All right. Thanks, everyone, for um, briefly pausing your W mass calculations and uh, and coming to our talk. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Shirley from uh, Fermilab uh, to tell us about some hot topics in neutrino physics. That should have been crucially in W, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nuclear, no, nuclear nuclear interaction are only through W effects. Right. Exactly. Well, also could be set effects, but those are not. <laughs> Okay, uh, cool. Well, uh, thank you everyone for attending. So right now there is a uh, large suite of uh, both current and planned neutrino oscillation experiments. And I think for theorists there are quite a few challenges that we need to overcome to make sure that these experimental programs have successful outcome. So today I'll talk about one problem that I think is the most uh, important input and that is to understand how neutrino nuclear scattering uh, how neutral nucleus sc scatter. So let's. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a. Oh, it's fine, that's true. Okay, uh, so obligatory slide on neutrino oscillation. Just to, after, say, 20 years of the experimental program, this is the standard neutrino oscillation paradigm that we've established. Just to make sure everyone understands the, uh, the terminology. So we have a three flavor. Uh, three neutrino flavors, nu yi, nu mu, nu tau. And we have three mass eigenstates, nu one, nu two, nu three. And these two bases are not aligned, and they are rotated by a PNS matrix with all the mixing parameters written list on the left. And just to uh, summarize, to flash, the, uh, to flash the progress we've made over the past few years and project it to next generation. So we see that uh, with one sigma error bar that shows the bands. So we see that by, by the end of next generation of neutrino oscillation experiments, we're actually able to reach sub 10% precision on all the mixing parameters. And for theta 2, 3 and theta 1, 2, we're actually reaching sub 1% precision. And just to draw a parallel to the quark sector, so the last column of black error bars show the present day uh, precision for CKM parameters. So of course, to make the visual comparison, I had to shift the central value. Uh, but basically, the takeaway is that by next generation, we're actually basically catching up to the present day quark sector measurements, of course, using, under the standard uh, oscillation paradigm. So I find that quite interesting. And so sometimes I show this figure, and I think it might lead to the impression that all that happens in neutrino oscillation measurement is to, well, is to measure well-defined parameters and shrinking error bars for, you know, three decades. And that's very much not the case. So I think the more interesting thing are the possible uh, surprises along the way. So I think the most two famous, the two most famous ones are probably the short baseline anomaly and the reaction anomaly. So the short baseline anomaly started with a LSND observing a axis of E-like events. And that was confirmed by mini boom uh, over, the last, over the last 10 years. And the reaction anomaly just refers to that Overall, uh, several exper uh, reactor experiments observe a deficit of new E-bar flux coming out of nuclear reactors. And the name of the guy mentioned? Sorry. It's an interesting name. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the first, uh, first author of the global... Uh, the I, I know, I know. It's strange. <laughs> <laughs> no, no comment. <laughs> Why do you look at these things? <laughs> 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 I've never noticed Don't that. mention it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Right, um, I should not have mentioned this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this paper has like over, I think, a couple hundred citations, so clearly people like to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and interestingly, uh, both anomalies are hinting at the existence of a 1 EV star uh, state. Somebody told me, I had a talk by Joachim Kopp, he was telling me that the reactor neutrino anomaly was going away due to new measurement. Yeah, I think both both anomalies are, I think, somewhere between like 50 to 80% of the paper in the literature are sort of debating whether they're still there, whether they're going away, because very similar to the short baseline anomaly, uh, for instance, uh, just to finish flashing this, as we have heard recently, Microboom put out their new analysis, and there's immediate like a debate in the literature about whether this rules out Miniboom or not. It's just both of these are, let's say, systematic dominated, and people cannot really agree on systematics. It's, it's similar for the reactor anomaly in that you know people don't agree on the reactor flux predicted, and every time there's a new calculation coming out, people say, ah, this ruled it out. 
Right, but then people say, ah, maybe this is like, then a couple of years later, people realize, oh, there's some underestimate of the uncertainty. It's pretty much the same story that happened over and over again. There was also an isotope dependence of the uranium. Okay. Yes, yes. So there's. Not, but then there's this uh, coherent length uh, problem. So there are all sorts of. Well, anyway, so. Yes, no, it, it's yeah. very. Yes, you're right. So there is. It's only made one goes one direction and the other. Yes. And so I would say both are still not resolved problems in, in the literature and probably will take a few years for people to hopefully resolve them. Mm -hmm. So the, the jury is still out on both anomalies, whether they're still there or not, but it's interesting to see. Okay, so that's the general uh, flash summary of the neutrino oscillation experimental program. So again, so today I will talk about specific problem neutrino nuclear cross-section. So let's see how this problem arises when people realize it's existed. So I think it really started out with Miniboon. Uh, again, Miniboon is experiment designed to test the LSND axis, which it did see. And the experiment was quite a while ago. It started in 2007. Um, but this experiment, other than the, uh, the ELEC axis, it put out another, I would say, almost uh, or actually almost as important or at least very important measurement and that's the axial mass measurement so if we write down nu uh, nuclear nuclear scattering with a weak current uh, like on top then one of the terms has an axial uh, has an axial form factor that can be parameterized by a dipole moment on the um, by a dipole moment that's on the region on the bottom so the so the and maxial axial mass I made is one the parameter. It's basically indicate how big the cross section is. So look at this summary. What minimum measures is the are the red data points, and you see that it's larger than all the other experimental measurements. So these by like quite a bit. So parameterized. So in terms of numbers, minimum measured axial mass about one point three, whereas before the measurement, everyone thought that axial mass is about one point zero. So this experiment, this measurement came out, surprised everyone because no one thought axial mass would, there's any disagreement there. And that really, really marked the beginning of people appreciating that, okay, it turns out it's difficult to understand neutrino nucleus cross section, interaction cross section. And this started basically a little more than 10 years ago. And so that and brings I me to- expect one TV in the beginning. What was the reason that uh, they expected so the dominant measurement is probably uh, the old bubble chamber data, so neutrino hydrogen, neutrino deuterium scattering, and they always gave they always seem to give a consistent measurement of about 1.0 GeV, and that's also consistent with like no mad kind of neutrino uh, scattering experiments. So neutrino scattering on hydrogen, hydrogen deuterium in bubble chamber, and also no mad in like nucleon. A nu nuclei, nuclei has always given about 1.0 and everything seemed consistent so there was no people didn't that didn't realize there were issues I mean that that, that, that that's a is that a, a that's yet that's the primary tradition there cannot be higher order terms and, you know, like what, what else? Uh, good point so so the dipole form uh, it lasted for quite some time and then I think starting from quite a few years back there are people start to advocate that dipole is really really not enough so there's the, the expansion and etc and that would fit the say the bubble chamber data better but even nowadays um, so even now there's this problem still present so this is the this is very new earlier this year um, um, basically form factor so now the the old bubble chamber data is parameterized by the Z expansion, which is supposed to work better. But you see, and now there's a lot of calculation of the axial mass, and it's still, you know, there's some issues about the uncertainty, but there still seem to be discrep discrepancy. There's basically neutrino scattering. Sorry, which one is lattice? The, the, the... All the, all these are lattice. All, all these data are lattice? All these error bars. Yes, all these all these error bars are lattice calculations, and you see the and the tension the, is that with the red band. Red band, which is the old neutrino bubble chamber scattering data. 
So uh, yeah. what would be the minimum measurement here? So what is uh... so minimum right? Minimum is uh, is not plotted on this plane, but it's closer to one point three. So it would have been actually closer to lattice. Closer to lattice. So hi, basically higher cross section. Very good. Yeah. So this problem started like more than ten years ago, and it's still very much not resolved. Um, Okay, so, but this really alerted everyone that there is a problem of neutrino nucleus scattering. So the outline of my talk would be three parts. So first, I'll actually try to explain how do cross-section calculations actually affect measurements. And the reason I explain this is, is uh, I think what you intuitively imagine is kind of a little misleading. And then I'll briefly describe how do we actually compute the cross-section and describe the current error bars. And then I will end on how we can improve the cross-section calculation. So here I want to really emphasize that uh, if at the end of the talk you feel like I mostly point out problems as opposed to provide solutions. And that is because I would say we, the field as a whole are still in the stage of trying to understand what the problem is, trying to quantify the problem. So we know that we can compute the cross-section very well, but we don't know what's the like what's the current error bar and what's the kind of error that we need to aim for next generation experiments. So, okay, so let's start with how do cross section measurements calculations actually affect measurements. So the experimental setup I need for the rest of the talk is the so called long baseline experiments or accelerator based neutrino experiments. So they generally follow the same setup. Let's say we have a neutrino beam out of accelerator that has energy between 0.5 to 5 GeV. Um, the signal flavor is generally nu mu. And then we want to let these neutrinos propagate over about 1,000 kilometers and see how much of that nu mu have oscillated to nu E. And we do this in both neutrino mode and anti-neutrino mode. This, would, this measurement would give us essentially all the oscillation parameters. And then, uh, because we know that we can't compute the flux and the cross-section very well, we put a near detector right next to the beam. So essentially to measure a control sample. So for instance, this setup applies to Doom, uh, NOVA, and generally hyper-K, T2K, and most of the ongoing accelerator-based experiments. That is a funny plot in the sense, that, does it make any sense to depict the curvature of uh, the why, why is this uh, why is that depicted there? So oh, it's it actually plays an important role. So. It's actually very important. Okay, very good. So because if there's no curvature, then the neutrino go you, it wouldn't go through much of Earth, right? But actually, for some like for example, so Dune can measure neutrino mass hierarchy and hyper-K cannot. The main difference is actually because Dune go through would be sensitive to, to matter. To matter for, effects. For yeah. So yes. yeah, so that's actually a key point. I see, very good. Okay. I thought you were going to complain that the source go from right to left. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mentioned. <laughs> because... Um, but, but you know, that is east and west, I guess. That and also these neutrinos are flipped, so I guess you could see that. <laughs> the other uh, strange thing is some for the ground reserve facility <laughs> shape, right? Uh, that is probably because it was an old mine and that was, that yeah. was, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so this is the general experimental setup. So now let's say that we just want to measure neutrino oscillation probability. So how would we do? Let's, the thing we want to measure say, is oscillation probability as a function of neutrino energy. And then naively, if you write it down, it's just flux at a far detector over near detector. And then let's say if we can predict what happened, we can predict the neutrino flux coming up accelerator, like most other type of experiments. Then the only thing we need to do is measure neutrino event rate and divide by the total cross section. OK. And Note that he, in this case, the cross-section that we care about is just total inclusive neutrino interaction cross-section. So if this were the case, we don't have a near detector, predict flux, measure things at far detector, then what we get is that the, error, the size of error on the total cross-section basically directly propagate into the oscillation probability. So of course, this is not what actually happens in these kind of oscillation experiments. But let's go with this and see what this says about the oscillation, for, uh, the cross-section accuracy. So here, I plot the appearance probability as a function of neutrino energy for three delta CP values. 
So I chose Delta CP because it's one of the most important quantities, say next generation experiment like Dune will measure. And I chose the three values because that's the expected one sigma precision. So this means that Dune will try to separate these three curves. And the neutrino flux really peaks at two to three GeV. So let's just focus on this bump. So you see at the maximum difference, the three curves differ by about 5%. So this roughly sets a scale that this is a, say, 5% measurement experiment. So that's, so that means that's the most conservative, like a theory budget. Now, okay, but this is not what actually happens in the internal experiment, because we do have a near detector. So now with a near detector, we don't have to predict this flux, we can just measure the event rate in near far and cancel out. And let's assume that the flavor difference between the new E and new mu is well appreciated and under control. Then it seems like to first order, we don't actually need to know anything about the cross section. We just need to measure event rate, cancels out, and that's it. So I think this is kind of uh, people's intuition when it comes to, because it's oscillation, there's a so-called near-far cancellation. But this is actually very misleading. Because what happens is when I write everything down, everything is a function of neutrino energy. And for a neutrino beam, the energy is very, uh, is very broad. And importantly, because neutrinos are neutral, we never see neutrinos directly in experiments. So we always have to guess the energy of neutrinos from whatever charged particles we can actually see. And this is really the crucial point about is that the king of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's that's the most embarrassing question I've heard. Really? <laughs> Who is this? That's the guy I've heard of. That's poor me. Sean Bean. He's yeah, a yeah. British actor. Oh, it's a, uh, and why he important? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. Yeah. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's, that's a meme. I see, that's a meme. It's the most important meme, I, it, most common meme. I didn't think it was good. But why the British actor is? <laughs> okay, that's all. I, I ask you. Okay, so the more important question from previous slide is, is that it's 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 crucial to see how cross-section calculations actually affect Depending. energy reconstruction. So, and okay, so now we have to talk about detectors. So let's say in, for a theorist view, this is how, to first order, this is how most neutrino detectors work. So you have a large uniform box of something, and you can see basically all charged particles above thresholds. So let's say a neutrino coming in, interacting with argon 40, because that's what Duke uses. And then because there's charge current interaction, we also have an outgoing lepton that you can see very well. And in addition, you get, because it's a few GV energies, you get some number of protons, pions, and neutrons. And okay, and say for something like a liquid argon uh, TPC, which people are very excited about, the advantage of the detector is that it see the particle threshold is very, very low essentially negligible. So then, in this case, uh, it's very obvious how we can measure the energy of neutrino just by energy conservation, because we can measure everything, we just added it up. And then the only thing we don't see in the detector is neutrons, because they're neutral. So if this were the case, and then it seems leads to the conclusion that it doesn't really matter what cross-section prediction we get wrong, the only thing we want to get correct is the fra energy fraction that goes to neutrons because that's what you can now see in the detectors you need to correct for it with your simulation everything else you see if you get it wrong you can just compare to your data and you see that there's mismatch and you're good okay so this is a of course simplified view of the detector unfortunately a detector doesn't work that like that so this i show a simulative view of a neutrino event in liquid argon so similarly, the neutrino is injected at zero, zero, and all charged particles are, are labeled in tracks and colored dots. So the, at the beginning, it, it looks very similar to what I just showed. You see a proton, pion, and muon track, clear and easy to identify. But then the problem is the protons and pion tracks split into multiple things, and there's also a, a cloud of purple dots. So those are actually neutral interactions in argon. And then because there's protons and pions would reinteract, 
it also means that you can't just you know easily identify the energy of the proton or identify the energy of the pion. So to skip a lot of details, the conclusion is that actually all fully exclusive aspect of cross-section prediction actually matters. Meaning that if you know if energy goes to proton versus pion, it affects how much energy in your detector is lost due to detector quenching, and it's not so easy to correct for. And second, even though the detector thresholds are really, really low, because there's a lot of subsequent reinteractions, every generation particle becomes softer, so more energy would actually fall below thresholds. So the spectrum of the hydronic particles also matter. And even the number of nucleons coming out of the vertex matters because some energy would lost to nuclear binding. So you break up argon, producing something smaller than argon, say a silicon. You generally think, of oh, this process has like it's a nuclear process, so energy scale should be about 10 MeV, much lower than energy scale here, a few GeV. It actually matters, it actually adds up quite a bit. So all aspects of cross-action prediction matters, which is, you know, of course, bad news for theorists. So let's make an hydrogen detector. So that would be great. Not neutrons. That would be great. Yes. Can, can, can you make a like a dedicated detector to measure this cross-action? Uh, really great point. Uh, that's something I will talk about later, and maybe I'll. That, that, the detector that can actually see neutrons. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the the answer is there are there are measurements that would help, but there is no measurement, or realistically, there is no detector technology that allow you to fully measure everything with like minimum theory input. Okay. So. Okay, just to summarize, so the cross section that we actually need is not the total cross section that can sort of get easily canceled out in near far extrapolation, but it's a fully exclusive cross section, which is, of course, harder to predict. And in addition, I just said the, so the previous argument is built on we just want to measure oscillation in near far, a standard oscillation near far detector. But I want to really emphasize the point that the exciting, probably the more exciting aspect of these experimental program is their ability to look for BSM physics because the detector capabilities are so good. But then because we don't actually know the cross section in the near detector well, it would affect, it would interfere with BSM searches. So here we uh, show two examples. So let's say if we understand cross section very well and we want to search for some, so here we want to look for a generic kind of signature search. Uh, so it, don't pay too much, so much attention on models, um, but we just assume that if there is a light scanner that couples neutrinos, you could imagine looking for neutrino scattering events with weird kinematics, say large missing PT. So this is a generic kind of signature search. So normally, how would you go about the search is the following. You have a, you measure your spectrum and as a function of missing PT per event. And you have your standard model background, that's the blue, and for these events with uh, radiated phi, then you would have a axis of uh, orange on top. And you take a ratio of your data over your standard model prediction, and this is uh, you will see this blue line where there is a bump of events with large missing PT at about 0.5 GeV, which is the mass of the uh, which is the mass of the scalar. So this is a typical uh, access search. Okay, so that's all good. However, now what happens with a near detector is you don't know the cross section. And so to deal with this, experiments come up with this procedure called near detector tuning to essentially adjust your cross section model based on what you see in your data. And of course, the problem is if you adjust your cross section model, you have to assume that there's no new physics. And so here we repeat this tuning procedure. And instead, if you repeat the whole exercise, if the signal is really there, what you would get is instead this blue black line. Now what you see with your data over standard, standard model tuned prediction is that in the signal region where there should be an access, uh, it's basically tuned away. The match becomes good-ish. And the artifact of the tuning shows up here. So instead you will see at your events with very large missing PT, you would see a deficit of prediction. So now this is a problem because if you see this in your detector, you probably would not think this is some new physics. You would think, okay, it's extremely tail of my standard model background prediction. I probably just messed that up. So the problem is 
without knowing cross-section, um, it will se severely affect our ability to search for BSM physics. So, but this really depends on actually the specific signature of the BSM physics. So for instance, we tried a different one, the stereo neutrino search. And then for a detector in near far detector, how would you first, how would you search for stereo neutrino would be, again, take an event um, in near detector, take your event spectrum in far detector, take a ratio. So if there's no tuning, then what you will get is this dashed green line. So, so characteristic wiggles that shows something interesting is going on. Now with this, you can tune your near detector. And after tuning, what you get is the black curve. So you said that the after tuning things are shifted a little bit, but this is not bad because if you see such characteristic shifts in your detector, you will see, okay, you would still realize that something very interesting is going on. So the conclusion of this is that some signatures are seem to be not robust against tuning and some are. So more work is needed to really understand how we can make this uh, more robust. Okay, but hopefully I've explained how do cross-section predictions actually affect measurement for both oscillation physics and for new physics search. So the takeaway is that we really understand what's going on with all the exclusive hydronic particles coming out of these interactions. Okay, so next I'll briefly describe how do we actually compute these cross-sections and also why it's so difficult. So let's say, again, our goal is to compute how a 0.5 GeV to 5 GeV neutrino interacting with a large nucleus, so argon. In this energy range, the process can be break up into two steps. Uh, it's a so-called impossible approximation because the wavelength of the probe is short, uh, smaller than the typical separation between nucleons in the nucleus. So first we can compute just how neutrino interact with a free or at rest proton or neutron. And I call that the primary vertex. And then we want to modify this vertex and take into account the fact that it's sitting in the nucleus environment. So for instance, the struck proton neutron is not at rest, but rather it has a forming momentum, it's bound inside the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And okay, so now looking at this, you might think the second part is more intuitively difficult because we essentially need to solve a nuclear structure problem for something that's large, like argon 40. But the first part might be easy because it's neutrino proton or neutron. Sorry? No, deep in scattering the first part. Right. But so, but what actually happens is that at the high en energy range of the spectrum, say four to five GeV, it's pretty it's, it's reasonably described by DS, which is something we know and know how to compute. But as we go to ener a lower energy of the spectrum, say a couple GeV, then we start to see baryon resonances coming out of final states, uh, which then decay to nucleon and meson. So this, these are final state particles coming out. And if we go to lower energy still, say like one GeV or below, then the hydronic degree freedom are entirely nucleons. You're just swapping protons and neutrons. Mm -hmm. So the problem is we are in the, mixt in the, in the mixture of hydronic degree freedom from nucleons to partons. And there's really no controlled expansion parameter that covers the entire re region. So this means that we probably can never get to some sort of clean theoretical description for the entire region. Also, it's very difficult to, to assess the uncertainty of the theory calculations because these are not essentially not controlled calculations. OK, just to look at that a little more uh, intuitively. So here is the phase space for doing events on, uh, for momentum transfer square and the X. So, and the heat map corresponds to where doing events are in the new detector. So the first thing you see is the darkest purple, like a round color. So I label that D as DS, which you should be alarmed by if you read the X axis. So I label them DS because I compute this using event generator and DS formalism is what's used to compute this. But this is only at Q square of one G square, which is actually way too low for factorization to work. But this is like this is the only tool we have, so that's what people use. But you can already imagine this has very large uncertainty. And then at lower energy still, so we go to resonance. So basically every word of every diagonal stripe corresponds to one final state resonance. So the difficulty here is that it's all blurred, so you can't see, but there's actually like 30 or so resonance states contributing. 
and you have to treat each individual one as separate you know, degrees of freedom. You have to measure all their form factors separately. And we just don't have that much precision data sitting on every single residence. And the last bit is a quasi-elastic region that sits on top, that's like the, the round blob at about x equals one. So that's actually the most theoretically controlled region. And it's a little bit unfortunate that for Dune, you see it's sort of like an equal mixture of all three components. So they're all kind of important. Of course, it makes the calculation even harder. OK, so again, because I said one difficult, really the kinematic region leads to that the calculation is difficult. But right now, we really need to understand what is the current theoretical uncertainty. And in fact, that's very much an open question. So because the theory calculations or even generated predictions don't give you theoretical errors, the one obvious way, if we want to get a sense of an error, would be to compare two event generators, two calculations. So this is what I did here. So this is basically total cross-section folded by flux, um, done by two most popular, let's say, neutrino event generators, Gini and Gibu. And so this is just a total flux. So you see that the total cross-section. The total cross-section differs by about 20% at 2 to 3 GeV region. Now you should be quite alarmed at this point because earlier I said just to get a sense, these, detect these experiments are about 5% precision experiments. So if the total cross-section already differ by like 20%, that means you know, our theory calculations is really not uh, very accurate. It's strange that the accuracy is minimal at the low energies, right? So then uh, is it because they use a similar uh, extrapolation to zero or what? So I was, uh, so I would say at like below one GV, it's, it, it's mostly quasi-elastic. I see. So that is basically the region that under, like, we understand the best. Oh, that we understand the best. I see. Yeah. I see. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so, but of course, comparing to theory to theory, it's not totally fair to get a sense of uncertainty because, you know, both could be running in the same direction or one could be actually really on point and the other is just really off. So more precisely, we want to compare a theory prediction to experimental data. And so you don't have to look at the plot too carefully, but this is just a collection of all recent neutrino measurements and uh, neutrino scattering measurements coming out of modern experiments, like in the past couple of years. And any one of these figures, so say the top one, NOVA, so you can say the theory prediction is the top of the blue histogram, and experimental data are the points. You see the discrepancy is like pretty big, of, I don't know, 20% or something at the, at the peak. And quantitative studies have shown that essentially for the current neutrino scattering measurements, there is no set of theories with theories have tuning parameters, even with tuning all the parameters, changing all the model selections, wow. there's no set of model or tune that can reproduce all neutrino data. New physics. <laughs> we should work together. <laughs> yes. And it just to emphasize that this is, and you know, this is typical measurement in true experiments. So they're not like super precise because, you know, statistics are limited, systematics are large. So these are not super precise measurements already. And even then, there's already no theory that can reproduce everything. But the NOVA, the NOVA strikes as very small errors, experimental errors, and then very large discrepancy with the yes. prediction, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so like if you were to quantify like a sigma or something, there is certainly more than, I don't know, 50 sigma. Right, right. The NOVA is striking because the other ones have very large errors, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very good. OK, so that just illustrates the difficulty of calculating cross sections and, um, and that we are currently not doing very well. OK, so next I'm going to talk about how we can improve the cross section calculations. And so here again, uh, I think just to reemphasize the point that for the past few years, I think we're still, the community is still in the process of like under better under understanding the problem. So for instance, one is what is the region that's causing most of the problem? So again, back to mini boom, because it was the measurements that really started out the discrepancy that people realized, oh, there's some difficulty. 
and that the mean moon is a low energy experiment, so the beam energy is below 1 GeV. It really draws attention to the fact that they're in quasi-elastic and the meson exchange region, so below 1 GeV, there's a disagreement. And this has been really the focus of the community for the past 10 years. But this really, but this really is only the smaller part of the problem because you know, again, for if where our focus is for Dune, you know, quasi-elastic is a smaller fraction of the event, and most events are in the so-called DIS or resonance, uh, resonance production region. And it's just taking a while for people to realize that this region is also uncertain and possibly more uncertain. And okay, and so. Recently, for the past few years, uh, we have realized that one super useful data set to benchmark our theory calculations is electron nuclear scattering data. So the existing, there's a, there exists a large collection of such data and they're all inclusive. Um, so the standard setup is you have a monoenergetic electron beam hitting either a proton or a nucleus. And then you put your detector at a fixed scattering angle, measure the energy of the outgoing electron. So this is essentially a single, dif a dif single differential inclusive measurement. And just to be very, very clear, of course, the measured uh, cross section is dominated by photon exchange process, which is different than W exchange process. But actually in terms of modeling, there's more ingredients that uh, electrons getting shared in common with neutrinos. So the first is, the two scatter because the difficulty is really on the hydronic side. So first you will write down the same model, whether a process is quasi-elastic, rest resonant production, or DIA as the model are the same. And once you write down the model, the electron scattering can inform you about the act of, about the vector couplings. So then the only thing that's still missing from your model is really the axial couplings. So for instance, if we can write down elastic, elastic scattering. For, uh, for current with nucleons, then the then we can then the only thing we need from experimental data are these four factors. And electron scattering can give you F1 and F2, and then you just need to measure two parameters. So that's like that that makes the situation more under control. And in addition, a lot of the nuclear effects obviously are in common. For instance, the nucleon the momentum distribution of nucleons before the interaction, that's the same, whether the probe is electron or neutrino. And also something called final state interactions are also the same, which is quite important for hydronic spectrum. So there's no flavor. And this is also a good example. Like gamma is a, gamma exchange is, a, is, 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 is diagonal in flavor. Right? Yes. And, the, and the, the W is not. Yes. And no W must have been used. No W mass dependence, but they're, 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 unfortunately, yes. But but the, you, you, the, the form factor does not have flavor dependence. Uh, no, the form factor, no. I, I, I mean F1. Yeah, F1. No, okay. So sorry. So you're, you're saying you can use the F1, you know. Yes. So the, so this F1 and this F1 are not the same. But you have to basically. What's the you basically rotate them in isospin basis, so they are real. So you're assuming isospin symmetry. You have to. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So theoretically, electron scattering and neutrino scattering are, let's say, actually quite related. And of course, the benefit of using electron scattering is that it's charged particle. We can easily manipulate it. We can slice the phase space however we want. Um, so for instance, uh, so here I show a set of electron proton scattering data and the data are the, the black points with air bars in both panels. So the benefit is the data quality is super high. That's quite intuitive. Um, the measurements are really fine in energy transfer and also the air bars are like tiny. And another important thing for the data is that this, because you can select the phase space so carefully, it clearly reveals an underlying interaction mechanism. So for instance, in this case, I use 2.4 GeV beam at a scattering angle of 20 degrees. And you see large three peaks. And so clearly those are resonance production regions. So using this, you can see how to fix your uh, neutrinos, uh, neutrino event generators. So here I plot two generators, again, Gini and Gipu. 
And the total uh, that should be compared to data are the solid lines. So purple on the left, green on the right. But that's not very helpful because that just shows, okay, you're off by quite a bit, but that doesn't tell you how to improve it. What's actually helpful is to look at the components. So the red dashed line are resins production for both models, which clearly should be dominating the cross section. So the first peak is actually delta production. So you see that Genie just underestimate delta production by a little bit. And then second and third peak, it just over, overestimated uh, the residence. And Gable does better, but there's also some underestimation in the second peak region. So it's just that it clearly indicates like how, we, how would you fix your event generator based on the data. And also, um, because as I said, keep in mind that this is really not DIS region, at least not factorization would work. So both event generators label something as DIS. They're not DIS in the, in the conventional sense. And you can see that Gini DIS clearly overestimates, like, is the reason that the total cross section is so big. Um, okay, so this just to show that the data are quite useful in terms of helping to uh, tune the theory. And I'll skip this. And similarly, you can go to different uh, energy and different scaling angle, and you basically get a consistent story. Um, oh, for instance, here I want to point out that here you actually see what Gibu calculate as real DIS, and you see that it basically it's an artificial cutoff. And again, because we don't really know what happens at the lower energy end of DIS, so generators just have to in, in, introduce like artificial cutoff, which clearly is not physical. But I would say this is a real open theoretical question because we don't know what other things we can use to compute cross-section there. Okay, so and also this gives us a sense of the error bars because the data quality is very high. So I would say roughly speaking, uh, Gini, which is the most uh, commonly used event generator for experiments, rough at an inclusive level has an error about uh, 50 to 80 percent. And Gibu does better, but still across phase space is about 20 to 30 percent. When they do, when they, they present data, they use both generators and they compare uh, with both generators uh, to give uh, some sort of systematic error. For oscillation experiments? Yes. Um, or that is not done? So. Not quite. I would say that people have been pushing for this, but in, say, NOVA and T2K, the main oscillation analysis is only done using one event generator. I see. Uh, Minerva start to use multiple event generators after people have been asking them, but that's starting to happen. They hasn't really happened, I would say. So normally, an event generator comes with tunes. Yes. Right. So the, the, this is, I think, you are comparing the event generator like out of the box. Okay. Correct. Out of box also comes with tune. Uh, which data do you, which data they have used to, to tune the, 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 the out of box generator? Good question. So um, I don't. Okay. So for instance, um, so look at the the Nova figure um, because it's it's fairly inclusive. This is actually part figure for their oscillation analysis. So that is default Genie on top of blue, and that's their data. Um, so that is the data they use to tune to tune the cross section model. What essentially they do after tune, they still disagree. No, no, after tune, it grades much better. Okay. But the, 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 the issue is that, again, because there's no, it's not like you're tuning some well-established EFT with just coupling constant. So there is no like a physical way to tune things. Like no one can tell you how to tune away that mismatch. So every single experiment tuned differently. Uh -huh. So if you look at the after tune cross section, it's still very, very different, if that makes sense. So this, so like say, Minerva, Minerva has a set of tune to, for Minerva measurements. And there has been study that Minerva take their tune, then apply it to Nova data, and then things, things again, like I really uh, disagree. What you're doing is, uh, is uh, also using the neutral current data to, to, right. to tune. Ooh, yes. So, okay. well, see, so the idea so why is. Why is that better than in using a particular experiment? Ah, a good point. So the good thing about electron scattering data is the data, you can really trust the data. Uh, the systematics are like, tiny. So, so that is a good point. Right. So like 
So for instance, here, you, you know the strength is delta, you can like turn your delta, then you know that at least for the vector part of the delta, it's, it's quite good. The difficulty of neutrino scattering is that yeah, because you don't know neutrino energy. So for instance, you attune exactly using this parameter called visible hydronic energy, which means that the x-axis already has information on protons, neutrons, and pions in it. So if you just tune the y, there could be, basically there could be errors on the x-axis that you can't possibly take into account. So you have to only tune the y-axis, but you don't, you don't know what's happening with your x-axis. So the, just the, if that makes sense. Well, that, that's not the only observable they have, right? So they, they, in principle, they have other distributions. They no, no, no. For Nova tune, they just tune on this. Okay, I'm just, in principle, they have other things, they observables, right? They yes. Yeah. They, match. Yes, they can look at, say, one proton, two proton, yeah, yeah, one yeah, pi, exactly, or two pi. Exactly. But no experiments have been doing this. And those measurements yeah. of, again, it's, so you, you can select one proton event in Nova which has large error bar because the particle thresholds are very high. You could be missing protons but and pions. Nevertheless, if you are, you are, you are tuned, you know, over predicted by a factor of 10, you probably should work. Yes, I agree. No, I definitely think neutrino experiments should look more exclusive at the data and better too. Um, but it's also hard to argue that like any of the data quality can ever reach like electron scattering. So in fact, I don't, oh, perhaps I should really emphasize that. I don't think people should just use electron scattering data because again, at first you can tune your vector part perfectly, but you're still missing axial. Here probably. you still have to quantify the ISO spin violation. Exactly. So that you have to use you have to use neutrino scattering data. So I would say I I am advocating for using both data set as opposed to only using neutrino. And currently we don't have uh, input from any lattice calculations in some sort for the form factor sensor. Good point. Uh, so that's basically what I showed. Um, that's basically what I showed here. So, for instance, for the so-called quasi-elastic scattering, this is a stats of lattice, right. and you know this is this is the range between one point zero to one point three. So it's still the error bars are still large, and this is quasi-elastic, so it's the it's the easiest. So I think I, BMW prediction. <laughs> so I don't think they have computed this. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, and if we're on the look at say ten year time scale, then I think people say for for lattice, they're hoping that they could get to um, like some sort of like a resonance maybe like here, meaning that they can probably get to delta in a few years with you know with reasonable error bars, and they can get like the next couple resonance states. But it's like it gets exponentially harder as you go to higher like baryonic resonances. Right, right. So I don't I, I don't think it's possible to say lattice can get to like all resonance region mm -hmm. on the 10 year time scale. Right. So it will be very helpful. Yeah. But of course, you know, even delta is very helpful. So I think they can cover part of the phase space, but definitely not all of it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for, for something like this fake DS, it's it's just it's just it's yeah. not clear. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, cool. And, uh, and uh, again, I just keep want to emphasize on this point that so almost all electron data now are inclusive, meaning it only tells you what happens on outgoing electron, which is of very useful. But again, in neutral experiment, what we really need from theory is the, the information on the hydronic system, because those are the things that neutrino detector can't see very well. So of course, it's we don't have exclusive data to compare to, and it's much harder to compute exclusive measurements. And we would obviously expect the errors on the exclusive uh, observables are bigger than inclusive. So that's completely open, and we just uh, we just don't know um, the current status. Okay, and another thing on the electron scattering side is that the with existing data, we can already it can in, already inform a lot of modeling problem, and it can improve it. But it's far from enough. So for instance, there's only a single set electron argon scattering data available, and that was only taken recently past couple of years. Of course, uh, for the, you know, with the US focusing on liquid argon technology, we want to have a lot more electron argon scattering data. And also the coverage is sort of 
not ideal. So again, this is the doom phase space. Uh, I now switched x1 and x's, uh, energy transfer and q squared. So say electron carbon is one of the best covered nuclei. And all the data points, existing data points are in red. So you see it covers a lot of this quasi-elastic scattering region. But the darkest region where this DIS uh, or shallow elastic scattering region happens, there's actually not much data coverage. So that's something that we want to fix. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is there's only inclusive data available. And luckily, one of the proposed experiments on the market, the light dark matter experiment LDMX, had turned out to be, uh, be able to take a great electron nucleus scattering data. So again, light dark LDMX is designed to measure light dark matter, look for light dark matter using this FET setup. We have a 4 GB electron beam hitting a thin target, and you measure the outgoing electron and all the hydronic particles. So again, for we could, this outgoing electron could radiate a pair of light dark matter or dark photon, which then decay to dark matter. Um, but for all of these, we will look for events with large missing four momentum. And so the, this figure shows the projected sensitivity. But now if we look at the setup, that looks pretty ideal for cross-section measurements. And just to quantify it a little. So first that it can measure everything in the forward uh, 40 degrees. So in terms of a doom phase space, that means that it can measure everything to the left and the bottom of the uh, blue, blue band. So you see the coverage of phase space is like really perfect. And also an important thing is that because it's a thin target, so it's very easy to cover exact same measurement using different nuclei. This is important because, again, as I said, the, measure, the modeling really is separate into the primary vertex physics and the nuclear physics, and those are completely different physics inputs. So if you can repeat different act, same measurements with different nuclei, it gives you a handle on how to separate vertex physics or the nuclear physics. So what is this experiment, the LDMX, or where will it be then? Slack. Slack. Okay. Um, right. And lastly, that's also super important, that it measures everything in the forward 40 degrees, so including protons and pions, and even it has some sensitivity to neutrons. So the setup is designed for dark matter, but turned out to be quite ideal for cross-section measurements. Yeah. Okay, so that brings me to my conclusion. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that understanding neutrino nuclear scattering is really crucial to the success of, let's say, long-term neutrino, neutrino uh, experimental program. And because of kinematic region, this, this is where we probably will never have a satisfying controlled theoretical calculations of the cross-section. And also it's difficult to assess uncertainties. Of course, it was just very important for experimental measurements. And we need more electron scattering data, which turned out to be very useful for informing uh, calculations. And also we need new theoretical ideas to actually say build better models or incorporate better incorporate data. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. That, that seems like a really important pursuit that I hadn't recognized the importance of. Um, are, are there any questions? So. Uh, you 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 tell the way the E, e plus e, 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 electron yeah. scattering data. Yeah. Uh, I, I perhaps I missed it. What if you use that tune that generator to to the to the charge current uh, experiment? But does it improve the event or? Uh, because I you, you I saw you at the beginning you said the uh, uh, genie and the, the other generator all, mm -hmm. none of them fit the the the, the, right. the the other neutrino experiment. Yes. Did you use the tuned? We haven't tuned it uh, ourselves. You haven't? Right. Work in progress. <laughs> oh. But this work with uh, Friedland that you are advertising, what do you do exactly? So, uh, so this actually, just to point out, uh, it, I think the first thing is just to really point out that the, the residence region and the DIS region are not, not really known. Because again, the, it's really, because the problem really started with mini boom. So like, I think most attention, most people, most expertise working on the problem are like a nuclear physicist. And they, they hear DIS, they think, okay, always good. And it took like forever to convince, to convince others that, okay, the DIS region probably actually has largest uncertainty. And another is to, is there are already actually existing expertise and data sets available. So for instance, this resonance region, so these models are built by looking at JLab data 
because you know GLAB has electron scattering that is sitting on essentially every single residence and measuring you know pi on angles. And those are, I mean, those are great. They work great, and but they have stopped somehow up like up including including new data for more than ten years, which, as you can see, basically you know it can solve this region quite well. So advocating the people to you know utilizing JLab data to do this. And you mentioned LDMX. What is the time frame for that? Yeah. So. Um, I guess right now the stage is in building the detector. So not the full detector, but it's only the first first part that's funded. So building, I guess, prototype of detector. Um, I think we're talking about like a few years, depending on the beam upgrade. So, but this is an approved experiment. So. Now the full phase, uh, the full phase is not funded yet, but the beginning phase is funded. But the DOE should have an interest on this. Well, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's going to discover the top one. <laughs> yeah, that I doubt. But if they, they, <laughs> but if they can contribute to this program, that's, that's good. Yeah, I think the data set will be extremely valuable. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't see why it would not. Yeah. Do you do similar things with uh, photon, like uh, nuclear fission experiments? Or like the photon need to be virtual or no 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 I think no I think like I think just photon scanning would also be would also be helpful. Um, I would say for I would say for inclusive measurement actually let's say just carbon. Um, actually the I think there's already a lot one can do with the data set like tuning event generators which it just hasn't hasn't happened yet. Um, and then. For the inclusive one, no data set can replace. If you if it's only inclusive measurement, it, like whatever the probe is, it doesn't help with the exclusive measurements, right? So I think it depends on whether, say, if there's exclusive data, it will be extremely valuable. If it's only inclusive, then I guess it would be it's uh, it will be quite nice combined with the electron existing electron scattering data set. If it's on argon, it will also be very helpful. So for event generators, um, are the form factors mm -hmm. input, or there is some sort of a theoretical version inside of that uh, code? Like when you say tune, mm -hmm. um, is, is there any one? some pseudo formula for form factors, and then you just to tune the parameters matching to the data, or that is like a blip black box, and then it's waiting for experimental input to be to be fitted? Uh, so, let's say Genie. A, let's they actually just use the dipole form, the, the, the dipole formula, and it has a default value of like a one point zero. It also has a Genie thinks uncertainty of I say point one or something. And what? But what experiment does is every single experiment they take they take the code, they change all these, they change a lot of these form factors. Let's say for Nova. Based on their new detector data, they have a in-house tuned version um, that they use. Okay. Yeah. But cannot be given to any other experiment. <laughs> that, um, uh, so if they are they are tuned value. So I mean that's what. So it sounds strange, right? It sounds. So actually, I think I think the community has made a lot of progress in terms of like opening things up. So for instance, Nova Tune actually was published um, ah, like, on ah. archive on GitHub. Very good. Uh, which is really how we are able to do the tuning study because we like we need code and they're actually published it in a couple years ago and say so t2k2 uh, which they're not published to public yet but like when we seek out to them say we want to use your tone they actually gave us the code so, so for the past few years i think does it differ much from the nova tune the, or in... quite a bit yes quite a bit. yeah so they were hesitant. They were like hesitant. <laughs> what we want to do with it? But that code. cannot explain. <laughs> but then it means there are difference in the in the results regarding the CPU rating parameter. Well, so that that's actually an open question because I don't think that's being studied. Studied. Yes. Yeah. That's also work in progress. Yes. Can someone try to have a best fit of all the existing data so they 
repairing a single thing that has a passive fit all of them and see what, what it tells us about that? So, so I think that's what I, I said last week. We need better ideas, but um, it's like the following. So let's say the worst case scenario, your models are based not based on anything. You just parameterize every single kinematic region with Wait, there's a, a, model, a right? tenth order polynomial. Yeah. And so in the total, you have a hundred, say a hundred parameters. And I'm sure, if, especially if you only stick to neutrino data, I'm sure of these hundred parameters, you can find somewhere that can fit all data with a reasonable chi square. That is only because the data are pretty crude, right? With like a large error bars. But that does not mean it, that, 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 that doesn't give you anything. Like you can use it to measure yeah. Delta CP that has, you have no idea how that actually relates to Delta CP. Right. I mean, I appreciate better now what, what you meant by like community trying to understand what the question is, right? Exactly. Because I can't even define a systematics in this case. Exactly. Right. So, so I think what really needs to happen is, for instance, for quasi elastic or resonance region, there's it's reasonable to write down, you know, matrix element and form factors. So at least those parameters are like real parameters. But again, that's still like that only gives you like a 60% events for the 40% of DIS. I think it needs to be some way to, to, to improve your model. So it's not a, some sort of polynomial basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks. No further questions. Let's thank Shirley again. So congratulations on your Irvan job. Then I just read that you accepted. Oh, thank you. Very good. Yeah, very nice place. Yeah.